A big welcome to our More Foundation pod venture. This is our space where we will hear the life stories, insights and wisdom from members of our thriving community. You will get the opportunity to learn from their life experience and hear the moments in life that have helped shape them. Mo is a growing global community of change makers and builders. We provide lifelong learning support to our community, enabling them to make a positive change and impact in our world. To find out more about Mo Foundation, please visit our website www.mofoundation.com or find us on social media. We look forward to connecting and learning about you. In the meantime, enjoy the latest Podventure. Okay, so welcome to the Mo Podcast. I'm Darren Robson, the host for this series, and I'm about to interview uh, a future host of the Mo Podcast, who is, uh, you know, one of the magicians that we have within Mo Foundation, Tony Phillips. So, Tony, welcome. Thank you very much, Darren. I'm really excited to to be here and see what's going to unfold out of this next little while. Absolutely, as I am, Tony, as we know, we, 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 we haven't got this orchestrated. So, um, you know, as you know, the first thing that I'm going to ask you is, so tell us about you, Tony. Okay, so I was born in Leeds. So my parents told me I could have played cricket for, for Yorkshire, but uh, I couldn't hit a ball or, or catch anything. So that was never going to happen. And uh, they were only there for a time because my parents were in the, in the armed forces. So my dad was a squadron leader in the Royal Air Force and my mum was actually a Wren and came out of service at the end of the war but my dad was actually a Spitfire pilot. He was too young to serve in the Battle of Britain but he did serve over in Italy in the latter stages of the war and my mum, which I only found out a few years ago because she was sworn to secrecy, worked in one of the um, satellite buildings from Bletchley Park. So if anyone's seen the film with Benedict Cumberbatch, can't remember what it's called now, the something game. When I took her to the cinema, she suddenly shouted out, I used to operate one of those. I was going, shh, (laughs) because my mum is now 96. So bless her, she hasn't got brilliant hearing these days. So that's why we tended to move around. So I moved, we moved from Leeds to actually Aden, which no longer exists. It was a, a British military base in what is now South Yemen. Oh, wow. So we lived there for two or three years, but I don't actually remember any of that. So, yeah, that, that's my upbringing. My dad left the, the forces basically when I was seven years old and we moved to Kent. And, I, and that's kind of been my, my parental home. My mum still lives in the same house since then. Interesting in terms of background beyond that, there's, there's a couple of things that have interest. One, my birthday is on the 4th of April. And any of you accountants will probably know that's the the last day of the tax year where you can claim your tax allowances. So my mum shared with me that uh, they had me induced and they did a deal with the doctor where they would split, you know, the tax. (laughs) No way. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it it probably kind of explains my attitude to money and how money has never been that important to me. (laughs) I think that's, yeah, I think it's a very funny story, actually. So that's why the 4th of April is my birthday, because I was induced to make sure I came in at the end of the tax year so they could get the, the benefits for the entire year. Beyond that, going back a bit further, my mum was a vicar's daughter, but one of her descendants was a guy called Thomas Clarkson, who apparently was one of William Wilberforce's right-hand men who helped um, overturn slavery in the UK. Oh, wow. Which is quite interesting. Absolutely. Some of these names and whether he was a right hand man or just somebody he you know who worked with him, I don't know. In terms of from my dad's side, his relatives grew up in Merthyr Tidville in Wales, mm-hmm. and two of them started newspapers. One of them was that started the Daily Telegraph, and I can't remember what the other one was. It's a paper that probably no longer exists and changed its names. One of them was Viscount Hemsley, and if you go to Chartwell Churchill's house, yeah you'll see his picture up there because he was one of the people who helped fund Churchill to be able to buy Chartwell. So yeah, that's um, obviously not, none of this down to me. This is kind of uh, the stock I came from, I guess. Absolutely. It's your stock. And it's also no, I understand why I have to doth the cap whenever I see you. Take <laughs> <laughs> and why you are called Lord or sire in my world. <laughs> yeah, very good. 
That's certainly not what I call myself. <laughs> <laughs> incredible, incredible stories, Tony. Yeah. So you grew up in Kent. So talk to me and talk to us about Kent then. Uh, I grew up in a town called Seven Oaks, which after the hurricane of whenever it was, I can't remember the year now. 89, wasn't it? 88, 89. It's, yeah, it was probably 88. It was just after I came back from Canada, because although I grew up in Seven Oaks, I then moved to Canada and lived there for nine years, starting in Toronto, where I was a couple of years, then Edmonton, Alberta, gradually moving west, and the last seven years in Vancouver. Amazing. And in those days, I was in IT, or when I started in IT, no one else will be able to recognize this. It was actually called DP, or data processing. And the, my very first job in DP, as it was, was operating a computer called an NCR 500, where I had to feed in magnetic ledger cards, and it had paper tape, and they used punch cards. And they didn't have their own computer, so they borrowed time. The office I worked in was in London Bridge, and they borrowed time from Standard and Chartered's IBM 360 just over the side of London Bridge. And we had this little old guy who drove a moped, and he used to take all the punch guards, the punch girls created to run a program, put them in his pannier at the back, and he'd drive them across the computer. They'd run the program, he'd bring back the printout. I remember one time he got knocked off his bike. He was okay, but all the all the cards went everywhere. So they had to come back and they had to recreate the whole thing. It was quicker than to sort them into order. So, yeah, I mean, it's bizarre when you think about it. I remember my dad, when he left the Air Force, worked for a company, um, IT or DP, as I said, as it was then, was looking for people from the forces who were, had experience of people management. So my dad got a role with, with one of those companies. I remember going with him one Saturday to Croydon and watching this IBM 360 being lifted by a crane up into this floor, several stories higher, uh, to put it into this building, into this air-conditioned unit. And obviously that whole computer was less powerful than my smartphone right now. So how things change yeah, and we'll carry on with your career story. I just want to stop there for a second because the other thing that's so incredible is that I believe both your daughters are in Vancouver now. Is that right? They are. They are at the moment, yes. Yeah. So I've got, got a son and two daughters. Both daughters are currently in Vancouver. They've both got Canadian citizenship, partly because I'm dual citizen. I took out citizenship while I was there. And just so happens that Nikki, my partner, was also born in Toronto and her dad was working there. So she came back when she was two or three, similar to me and leaving Leeds. And so she's got citizenship. I have two, but because I wasn't born there, you know, our daughter gets her citizenship from Nikki. Right. And Caitlin's out there. She's my youngest and her boyfriend is on a two year working visa. So they've just been working. They arrived there actually on, I think the second or third of March last year, just before lockdown happened. So it's been a little bit trying for them, but They've certainly, you know, explored their way around a bit when they could. And they've actually now just quit their jobs and have bought a car. They've got a an SUV that somebody's built a bed in the back for them. So they're living in it and they just went off on Sunday and they're, they're traveling around BC at the moment, just exploring. So they're having a good time. My other daughter, Sydney, who is actually, a, she's a qualified mo coach. My ex-wife was a dancer and a dance teacher. So Sydney was a dancer from the age of about two or three and followed that as a career and worked as a performer, but is now a choreographer, come movement director and director. So she's been really lucky. She's one of the few people I know who's trapped, been on three different continents during COVID. So she started off, she was assistant director on a play in Tokyo when COVID hit. And she made a beeline back to Vancouver and she's decided to make that her home now. But she's been back again this year to do the same show again with a different cast with the director from the UK. And she's actually coming back to the UK in August as well to do some work. So she's one of the few people in, in the arts who've actually had some work. And she's been in Asia over in Tokyo. She's been in North America and Canada. And she actually already came back here at Christmas to do some work as well. Incredible. So, yeah. Wow. Well, and Toby? Yeah, Toby's my eldest. My son lives in Seven Oaks, about 12 miles away. And he's got uh, two lovely children, my grandchildren, who are 10 and now four. 
yeah so they're great fun so i do get to see them quite a bit they live about a mile away from where my mum is and he's uh you know one of the things we'll get into is one of your passions is uh, music isn't it he's a muso isn't he he is yeah he's a very talented musician far more talented than me I was always passionate about music from the age of 10 or 12, I think. I think it was listening to Motown, people like the Supremes, and switched me on to music. And I've always loved music. Um, I'm not sure where it came from because neither my parents were that enamored by it and played much music. But I didn't actually start playing or performing until I think it was my 30s, actually. A friend of mine in Vancouver who'd never been interested in music was having saxophone lessons. And I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. So I started taking saxophone lessons. That then changed when I came back to the UK. I, I took a few lessons here and then I kind of let it go. And then my brother-in-law was heavily involved in the church. They were looking at setting up a band to do some fundraising for the church. And the vicar, the vicar of their church was a uh, semi-pro singer in the early days of pop, I suppose it was, from the 50s or 60s. I'm not quite sure exactly when. And he was the singer. And at one point, they were doing lots of sort of old throwback things like Wilson Pickett in the Midnight Hour. And at one of their rehearsals, he said, we could really deal with a sax on that. And uh, my brother-in-law said, I think I know where I might find you one. So I was came into that to play on that. At one point, he dropped out. So I turned into being the singer of that band. Then I teamed up with a, another guy as a duo. And then I played in a functions band for about 10 years. Bit of sax, a little bit of bashing a tambourine and a lot of singing and had an absolute ball. I loved it. I guess the thing about singing for me, although I haven't done it for a long time, there was something about it when I was performing singing, I felt I was really connecting and communicating my real self where I wasn't in lots of other areas of my life. So that's been one of the beauties of, well, I mean, there's many, many beauties of music. The fact is it's a language that everyone understands. It crosses all spoken language barriers and it communicates so much not just in the words but in the emotion of the music you know there's still songs that i can hear and every time i hear them make me cry Mm. (laughs) and i just think it's so emotive and so powerful so i'm still passionate about music you'll find me washing up in the kitchen trying to find the harmonies to different songs right from the early days i listened to a little bit of the everly brothers because they were still around somewhere in the wings Beach Boys, the Beatles, mm. and I was always fascinated by the harmonies because it, it just seems like you add a second voice and it triples or times 10 the quality of the sound. So, yeah, that's something I'm still passionate about. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that we share in common is it's quite funny when I always listen, you know, when I listen to your life story is, is it's almost, uh, and there's a parallel track to it, and then there's obviously difference, but one of the parallels is that you and I both pretty much started off in our careers completely on the wrong track. Yeah. So, you know, you are not an IT person at all, like, as, as you can share. And then you are very good at relationships, as we know. So I can understand why the sales piece came in. So tell us that story of what was the moment, when was the moment when you, you started to realize, actually, this isn't for me. I need to go and explore and find what is for me. And how did that happen? Well, I guess the first realization was fairly early on in my career. During my first job, I think I was there a couple of years, and I handed in my resignation, and me and a friend were going to go traveling to Europe, we decided. And I mean, it was a decision, but there was no action behind it. It was just something we we talked about, and it didn't happen. So the company I was with said, would you stay on? Because at that point, I was programming, and they said, would you stay on? We'll pay you a bit more if you do some operating to stay on a few months. So I did that. But at that point, I already thought this isn't really for me. Then I met my first wife and I went out to Canada in 1976, just on a holiday for three months. She's English, but I actually met her just before she emigrated originally. So we stayed in touch and she lived in a house in Toronto and I went and lived with her in that house. And I lived there for as I said, for three months, went to the Montreal Olympics, ran out of money, got a job on the local fun fair, which was brilliant fun. That was such a laugh. So, so I worked on one of those machines where you sign a piece of paper and you put it into this so-called computer and it spits out, um, you know, it tells you about who you are. It was great. These people would come along and quite often 
a girl would say, oh, I've done this before. It's brilliant. And her partner would go, yeah, yeah, I don't believe in this. And she said, go, go on, do it. He go, OK, I'll do it. And it came out and went, actually, this is really good. But um, so I met all sorts of people. I know those things weren't credible at all, but uh, it was just quite entertaining. I met so many different people and, and just loved it. I needed, you know, a Canadian social insurance number for that. And as I didn't have one, I was running out of money. The guy who owned the house we lived in was an American draft dodger, gave me his social insurance card. So I was, I was known as Marty. <laughs> so his name was Martin. So people kept calling me Marty. I didn't answer. And I suddenly went, oh, yeah, they mean me, don't they? So <laughs> then we actually even moved when the fun fair moved from Toronto to London, Ontario. So, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I had to get back into IT then because I got married and fairly soon after we had children. So I had to knuckle under, but it never felt like it was me mm. all the way through. I wasn't bad at it. I was quite good, actually. But it just felt... Let me put it this way. When I left school, I said, I don't know what I want to do, but there's one thing I know, I don't want to work in an office. Mm. So I tried at that stage, I wasn't aware of other possibilities. So I tried various laboring jobs and I didn't rate them too much either. I think the, the longest I lasted in one was about three weeks. So I ended up, my dad had contacts, as I said, within the IT business and one of his old RAF friends had started a recruitment company for DP, as it was, as I keep saying. And he said that I'd scored one of the highest in terms of my potential. I don't know whether he just said that to everybody or not, but um, I did seem to be quite good at it. It's just my, my heart wasn't in it. Hmm. And that carried on right the way through Canada. When I came back, I was recruited by BT and they moved us back to the UK because my dad died while I was out there, actually, after I'd been out there a year, two years. And we stayed out there for a while, but I came back because my mum was on her own. And my two kids at that point, Toby and Sydney, you know, all their relations were back here, grandparents, cousins, everybody. So mm. that's kind of what brought me back, went back into IT. And it was actually the last job I did in IT. I said, look, I want to move out of being a technician. And I thought, well, maybe I could become a you know, technical manager or something like that. The last company I worked with, I was sent in to do this job. It was a consultancy to do a 30-day project to see if we could build a system that could hold the fort while another bigger system was being built, if we could create something. And I basically turned that into a 30-day project, sorry, from a 30-day project into a quarter of a million pound project with a team of about six that I led. And the consultancy I worked for, they said, and they said, you seem to be quite good at building rapport with people and gaining their trust quite quickly. And I went, am I? I didn't know that. And they said, you should go into sales. And I said, wait a minute. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's what I did. And once again, it still wasn't quite right. And I stayed in that. And then I joined a company where I came across somebody who'd done a personal development course. Uh, it was actually called the Landmark Forum. And... She didn't push it on me. I just said to her, it's a fairly small organization. It was actually an Indian IT company. We were the offices in the UK. All the development was done over in Delhi and a couple of other places within India. And I got a chance during my induction to talk to everybody there. And she was different to all the others. She was very positive. Quite a few of the others were, mm, it's hard out there. There's not much about, you know, it's really difficult. You might struggle. And she was going, there's plenty out there. And some of her language was a little bit different. I said, tell me, what is it makes you so positive? And explain to me some of these words you're using. And she said, well, this all comes from this course I do. And I said, I want to do that. <laughs> so I basically signed up on the spot and did that course. And that was where I first came across coaching. Mm. And that was also that weekend, that very first weekend I did that course. I remember coming back taking my dog for a walk in the park on the Monday morning, the day after the course, thinking, why didn't I learn these skills about listening to people and about, you know, how to deal with relationships and relating to other people in school? You know, all the stuff that I learned in school, most of it, I used it in exams and then promptly forgot about it. I thought the stuff I've just learned here, I could use every day. <laughs> and I literally have since that day. Mm -hmm. So I was inspired by that. And then I took on a coach in my sales job. And while doing that, I decided to 
research coaching and I used to go up to the London coaching group which meets once a month I used to go to their meetings and I just used to sit there and listen to the speaker one of which who I saw was a lady called Carol Wilson and I remember her telling the story about Richard Branson the fact that he was a coach even though he wasn't trained he was just by his nature a coach and I'd never forgotten that story and I just talked to people and said are you a coach where did you train what are they like and so I, I kind of sussed out what was about and there weren't as many coach training organizations as there are now and I just picked one that I thought was most in tune with me and where I wanted to be at that point in my life I'd also felt that you know I was quite good at doing logical work within IT but I believed I had a creative side and that it was gradually getting strangled. And if I left it much later, it wouldn't be there. So that's the reason I picked the coach training school that I did, which incidentally is the one that you picked. That's the story of how I, I kind of escaped from IT sales. And I knew immediately I got into coaching that it was right because I never read books, never read anything. Ever since I got into coaching, I just devour books that are about what makes us tick, how our minds work, and anything to do with that. No, absolutely. And just to join some dots, so Carol Wilson is a trustee of Mo, and her course is the course that you will get to receive, those of you that do it. So that's part of the gifting from Carol, and I've known Carol for nearly 20 years myself. And then the course that we did was actually Coactive Coaching, wasn't it, that's still around? It was, yeah. And the book is a really great one, and, and the course, I'm sure, is still brilliant. And for me, what was attractive to me, I'd love to see if it was for the same for you, was that they talked very openly about the power of intuition. That was the thing that really drew me in, was that. Because I was like, I've got this thing inside of me, and it's like, I don't know what it is, but you know, it's, I didn't know it was intuition. I just, I just always have this sense. Mm. And that was the first time, really, that it was fully validated in me, that actually, no, that's something to really listen. That's an intelligence, you know. So what was it that really drew you in into the coactive world? Well, it was pretty much exactly that. It was that and the fact that it was an experiential course that was done, you know, face to face with a small group of about 20 to 25 people. And I just loved that whole immersive experience and the connection you make with other people, which is kind of what Mo does as well now. So it was that experiential, whereas the, the two that I brought it down to was that one and another one called Coach You. I'm not sure if they're still around. Thomas Leonard. Thomas Leonard, yeah, founded it. And they theirs was very much, they sent you manuals and it was all done over tele sessions. So you did it in, in your home, you read stuff and you, you talked to people on the phone. And, but I really wanted the experiential bit. And as you said, the same thing about the intuition. The intuition, the creativity for me went together. And I love what they said on that course that we all have intuition and it's talking to us all the time and it's always telling us the right thing it's just that we've lost practice of actually listening to it so sometimes to begin with we misinterpret it but it's still telling us the same thing and the more you use it the more you get to understand what it's trying to tell you and i do believe that to this day i concur so yes yeah yeah, yeah. no absolutely so just to give us a, a sort of in um you know, in the time scale. So what year are we at now, Tony? In terms of me doing the course? Yeah, but in your time scale as well, obviously. So, so it's what, 2002? 2002, I did my fundamentals course with CTI, Coaches Training, Coactive Training Institute, as they are now. And I was very lucky because I did it. My two leaders were two of the founders, Karen and Henry Kimsey House. How amazing. Which was, which was fantastic. Very inspiring people. And one of the things I remember hearing during that course was Karen Kimsey House talking about how her and Laura Whitworth, one of the other founders of CTI, did work in prisons coaching. And I always thought, hmm, I wonder what that's like. And then that just lay there dormant <laughs> mm. for quite a while and then came out obviously later, later in my story. And I actually... I took a break. I didn't go straight on and do the rest of the course because I was involved with Landmark doing other courses of theirs at the time. And they had a stipulation that you couldn't do it while you were doing something else. So when I finished their Introduction to Leaders program, I went, okay, right, I'm parking that now. And then I did the rest of the CTI course, which I think I graduated in, I can't remember, June or July 2003. Mm-hmm. 
Amazing. And that's where you and I, you know, that's when we collided, wasn't it? That is when we collided, yes. <laughs> you want to tell that story? You tell it so beautifully. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was kind of strange because even though we, at that time, we didn't live that far apart, we were both in Kent and you did a different course. You did a course up in Manchester and I never did find out why you did the one up in Manchester when you lived in Kent, but I did the one in London almost at the same time. And there were a group of people who created a co-active group for CTI graduates. And I got involved in that. You got involved in that. And I ran a marathon. I ran the New York Marathon later that year. So I graduated in June or July. The New York City Marathon was in uh, November. I'd actually previously put down to do the one in 2001. And that was just a couple of months after 9-11. I was still going to do it, but I got a chest infection and I had antibiotics, praying that I'd still be able to do it. This is the 2001 one. I went back in the day before I was due to fly out there and the doctor said, you've still got it. You need more antibiotics. And I said, is there any way I can do the marathon? She said, no, you shouldn't do it. So I backed out of that and it took me two years to go back and do it again. Just so happened it was the same time just after I'd graduated from CTI as a coach. And I had actually done a marathon before that, 15, 15 years before, 88, I think it was. It was, I think it was about the seventh ever London marathon. And that one, I wasn't very well prepared. I came back from Canada, watched it on TV that year. I saw all the different shapes, sizes, ages, just the variety of people on it. And it just seemed like such a a street party with people running along. I thought, I'd like to do that. So I sent in my application, started going jogging in the lunch hour. I was working in London at the time for BT, actually. And then after a little while, I got bored of that and stopped doing it. And then in December, this um, letter landed on my doorstep saying, you've, you've got a place in April. And I kind of went, shit. So I had to train right the way through the winter. I was working full time in London. So i, I quite often go out at 10, 11 at night to do my training. I didn't have a head torch or anything like that in those days. On several occasions, tripped over a tree route that I didn't say, came back all bloodied. And I hated the training. I joined a running club right near the end just to get some company and, and found another guy who'd done several ones before. And we were of a similar standard. So we trained together over the last few weeks and we were going to run it together. And we got to the Isle of Dogs, which is about 16 miles into it another 10 to go and someone cut in front of my buddy and he stopped had to stop immediately and both calf muscles locked up and he couldn't release them at all so he kind of hobbled the rest of the way back and he said you better go ahead that wasn't in my plan at all so I had to continue for the last 10 miles and I suffered every single every single mile I kind of went I survived by going next lamppost I'll allow myself to walk and I continued that pretty much almost to the end until I think about a mile from the end, I started to go uphill and I started walking and I heard someone yell, you know, get your ass in gear. You can still get over there in four hours. So I did. I, <laughs> I got going again and I got over in four hours, basically, but hated it. So I hated all the training, hated that. So totally stopped running for a while and thought, oh, thank God for that. And then something crept in, this little niggle going, <laughs> and I realized what it was, was I was missing running, which, which I couldn't understand. But once I'd done it, once I'd separated the marathon and just did it for fun, I realized I'd grown to enjoy running even without realizing, even through my hatred, I'd grown to enjoy it. <laughs> and, and, and then someone said, well, why don't you do it again? You know, that was a long time ago. So I did the New York one. And while I was training for that, Nikki, my partner, found this guy called Jeff Galloway, who had a column in the the weekly Saturday Times, I think it was. And he was an ex-Olympian who swore blind by the run-walk method. And he said, you know, he told the story of people who had tried to break the three-hour mark in a marathon and had never been able to do it. But using the run-walk method, they'd done it. So that for me went, you know, it's not a, you know, giving up on it. And the reason being is that every time you walk, you're using slightly different muscles. So that's what I used for the New York City Marathon. And although it was slower than the one I did 15 years earlier, as I crossed the finishing line, I went, I love that. I want to do another one, which was very different from my first experience. And so a few weeks after coming back from New York from the marathon, I was thinking, what can I do? I'd like to push it a little bit more than a marathon, but I don't think I'm up to an ultra. 
And then on a long Sunday run, this idea came into my head about, well, I've just qualified as a coach and I want to do something more with a marathon. So why don't I run the marathon while coaching people who are at home over a mobile phone? And they call me and I coach them on the way around. And I thought, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> and I came back and, and I told my partner, no, apparently not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I told my brother and sister, friends, apparently not a good idea all around, actually. <laughs> and everyone was saying, well, shouldn't you really be marketing your, your business? Isn't that what you should, you know, you're just qualified as a coach. You've actually quit your job. So you should really be putting a lot of effort into there. And I went, yeah, I know, but there's something in this that says I need to do it. And I don't know what it is. I have no idea, but I want to do it. And I started telling some people in, um, in the coactive community about it. And some of them were, wow, that sounds cool. But no one else said, yeah, I'd like to do that until this guy phoned me. And it's a guy called Darren Robson. <laughs> <laughs> you fancy a, a co-conspirator on this and yeah so that's how we met we spent I think every week once a week we got together and you brought your management consultancy hat on and we had different flip charts all over the walls that we'd take from your house to my house planning you know our four-pronged approach of getting people to sponsor us and be our coaches getting the local press interested in what we were doing which strangely they were and getting equipment manufacturers to support us and the fourth one was you know getting maybe some people that everyone would have heard of you know maybe celebrities that we could coach to, to raise the profile of it and we were partly successful and partly not but it was a great experience and yeah and we've been good friends ever since yeah no no absolutely I, I just remember I still remember it like seeing it and going that's absolutely nuts I have to do it <laughs> You know, I, I think at the time I just entered my 30s and I'd set myself a target of one marathon every year in my 30s. So it would have been, yeah, um, I'd just turned 30. And so it was just perfect timing. And I saw it and just thought, that's absolutely crazy. I've got to get in contact with you. And, and then we just had so much fun with it. And you you taught me so much, Tony. I, I don't think I've ever shared it with you, but, you know, I wasn't good at sales. I, it was the first time I'd set my own business up. It was lifeless ordinary, you know, looking at working with female entrepreneurs. And I had no idea. I'd just left a big corporate gig, you know, to go and set my own business up because I just had this calling set up businesses. I've always had that calling since I was 11. And, um, yeah, I didn't know anything about sales. And you taught me so much with the way that you got the trainers and the way you approach people. I think we also did some workshops for people to earn a bit of money for it, didn't we, and things like that, which was great. We were running for different charities. So I was running for, I think it was National Children's Homes, or I think that was the one I did it for on that one. I can't even remember which one I did it for. I've, I've run four marathons in all, but they've all been children's charities. Yeah, it might have been. We both did NCH. You know, it was NCH it was called then. So, But I just remember that moment of seeing it and going, that is that is a crazy idea. I have to reach out to Tony. And just that was it. And then we just had so much fun. And, I, you know, I only ever see it through a massively positive lens because of the fact that you and I met. And here we are all those years later, you know, 19 years or 18 years later, or whatever it is, and still very close and co-conspirators in Mo and all sorts of other fun and games. Mm. So, yeah, so I mean, just incredible thing. So just it just sort of I think the message is like if you've got a mad, crazy idea and loads of people in your family are saying, don't do it, just find one person that will follow you. And, and I was that person for Tony. And so important isn't it yeah and it's through meeting you i'm involved in mo and through doing mo i found spark inside and also from doing mo i found young women's trust so most of the work i do now has come indirectly through meeting you so um all those people who said you should be doing marketing i actually was doing marketing i just didn't realize i was <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah and likewise i mean it's you know, we've tracked along together for all those years and just learned from each other, Tony. I think that's what's so incredible about it. And just, you know, I've always tried to kind of have a bit of a safety net, whereas you've always just been really brave and just gone, no, I, I know I want to run my own business and I just want to keep doing this. And, you know, you've written all sorts of different articles and done your running. So why don't you share the stories of, of how that started to emerge, how you turned your passion for running into a passion to help other people? Yeah, OK. Um I carried on running with a running club. I'd turn up, you know, once a week, their socials, everyone would meet, someone would set a route and then everyone would go off. And, you know, I quite enjoyed that. I've never been a good runner, as in fast. I've always considered myself mid to back of the pack. I mean, you know, I, I ran the other day and a father and son 
ran up the hill, overtook me and just disappeared into the distance. And that, that's always been what I've been like. But there's something about freedom for me in running. So I've quite enjoyed it and the way it makes me feel. The fact of, you know, exercise and movement has been important to me. I've always said that the main thing I got from my schooling was, you know, not necessarily the exam results, but my love of, of sport and physical movement. And that stayed with me right the way through my life, with some exceptions. I think when I first moved to Vancouver, I didn't do any sport for a while. So when I joined a football team, I was shocked with the first time somebody kicked a ball to me and I went to trap it and, it, and I missed it completely. <laughs> But I actually got back into it and played in a league for quite a few years until I wrecked one of my knees. But anyway, so I tried a few times. I, I was curious about whether you could run every day. And, and all the books and everything would always advise you to you know, run, have a day of rest. So run maybe three or four days a week and have rest days in between or do other exercises. But I've never been into gyms. and Football and squash, which are the two sports that I enjoyed, I tore a cartilage in each knee. So one over in Canada playing football and the other on the squash court playing squash. So those sort of things weren't available to me. And strangely enough, did all four of my marathons post those cartilage operations. Everyone kept saying, well, can you do that? And I went, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> and I tried a few times running every day and I got up to about 10 days. In those days, I thought running was had to be sort of five or six miles minimum. But when doing that, you know, at the end of 10 days, I was just knackered and I just couldn't go on. I thought, I can't do this. And it was Christmas time, 2009, people started asking, what, what are your New Year's resolutions? And as I've been a coach for a while, I'd seen people set themselves or say what their New Year's resolutions were going to be. And invariably, most people failed on them. So I said, well, I haven't actually got a resolution, but uh, I know what I'll do. I'm still intrigued by this running every day bit. I wonder if I ran a mile a day, if I could do it for 31 days for the, the month of January. So I set myself an experiment to see if I could do it for 31 days and got to 31st of January and I found it easier than I thought it was going to be. I thought, yeah, well, actually, if you do something small enough that it's not going to impact you heavily for the next day, it seems that you can do it. So I then went, well, I wonder if I wonder how long I could do it for. Rather than just say, let's see if I can do it for February, I just extended it to, let's see how long I can do this for. So it was open-ended. There was no target. It was an experiment. And I started doing it. And at one point, I started writing a blog about doing it. And someone else involved with the running club saw what I did. And she had a role at the time as assistant editor for Running Fitness Magazine. And she said... I like your blog posts you do. Would you write something for Running Fitness Magazine? So I did. I sent it in and they liked it. And they said, would you be interested in doing a monthly column? And if so, could you send us some ideas of what your first few articles would be about? So I did. And they said, yeah, we like that. So I ended up writing for this magazine for just over three years. I think I did 40 monthly columns over that time. And... Yeah, so that I really enjoyed. It was very different from any of the other columns in the magazine because most of those are about how to improve your running. And mine was actually a coaching column disguised as a running column because <laughs> what I wrote about was what I learned about life and about myself, A, from running and B, from having a powerful daily positive habit because mm. I began to realize that having a powerful daily positive habit is – one of the keys and that's something that i'm still working on but i think it's one of the most fundamental things coaching is great and everything but we all have ups and downs and we need something we need to work on on a daily basis that helps us to you know to reach our potential because i used to get knocked down quite badly in fact you know if something the rug was pulled from under my feet i kind of lie there wallowing for a bit and it took me a while to get back up again and i found that by doing the running I could bounce back a lot quicker. Mm. And so I thought there was something in that. And and occasionally I get a letter into the magazine from somebody saying, I've just got your magazine and I've just read Tony Phillips' article, a Mile a Day, and I've run several runs, but I've always been the last place. And quite often they're packing up the finish line by the time I get there. It's always very disheartening. I just think, why do I bother? 
I'm useless. And then this one letter I'm thinking of, this person said, but I've just reading that, I realize I'm a winner. When I compare when I started running, I couldn't you know, get up the stairs without getting out of breath. Now, tomorrow I'm going to be running this 10K and whatever I do with the finish lines there or not, I'm a winner. And thank you for, for making me realize that. And just things like that made me realize the impact it can have on other people. But even then, it took someone else actually to say, you should do something with this and share what you're doing other than the magazine. So that's where, you know, my Facebook group came came about. And, you know, there's various people doing it, not, not all running, but some just some walking. I say just walking. It's not just walking. It's walking a mile every day or running or cycling or swimming or whatever you choose to do. It's really about getting outside in nature and moving forward as a magical quality. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I love it. And it's, um, we'll make sure that the links are on it when we publish this. I mean, we can get into your coaching stories in a bit, but I think what would be more fascinating for people to hear, because I just love the eloquence and just the clarity that you've got, you know, as, as we often do, because we love reflective practice and you can hear it in the way that you've you glean every inch of learning out of every experience. You really do. It's just fascinating to me. And in this journey, one of the things that I know that you've struggled with and of now you're on, you know, you own it is your voice. Mm. So share that because so many of us, me included, you know, and others, you know, that's something that we've all, and we all struggle with at different times and I love the way that you talk about life is a bit up and down because I think that's so beautiful to share because I've never ever met anyone who's a creative soul spirit intelligence who doesn't have a bit of a roller coaster I've never ever met anyone that doesn't and yet we make it wrong like it's like oh no you've got bipolar or you're mentally unwell or unstable it's like well no actually life can sometimes you know it does pull the rug under your feet and it doesn't feel great and you know sometimes you do have to wallow in order to kind of find the, the genius within so you know, share, you know, your, how your voice, how that process has unfolded, the kind of, if you like, the imaginal cells of the Tony butterfly. I'm not saying you're a butterfly, but for the moment, <laughs> let's go with that metaphor because, you know, you do flip and fly around all over the place now, you know, making people feel good. So that's what a butterfly is to me. So there you go. You can be a butterfly for a second. Thank you. I assume that's a compliment. Darren. It's a massive compliment. <laughs> I'll take it as such. <laughs> Something you may not be aware of that I've realized recently, and that is the reason that I didn't have a voice was when I was at my junior school, I suffered abuse at the hands of a headmaster. And I'm not going to go into that. And when I went on to senior school, I was quite small and I was bullied. So my response to that was to hide. Mm. My response was to stay invisible because I wouldn't be seen and other targets would be picked instead of me. doesn't sound very uh, generous, I know, but that was just self-preservation. And so I think I always, I always hid. And I remember, you know, some of my first jobs, I remember even in Canada, if there was, you know, if there would be a meeting of more than four people, I wouldn't say anything because I thought, I either thought I'd get laughed at or, you know, someone had already said it and I'd missed it or something like that. So I just kept quiet. And that happened for many, many years, really. And, and it's, still, it's, it's still a work in progress. And I told myself, I think, because I allowed that to happen to me, that I was pathetic. So I've had this side of me that's always believed that I'm, you know, I have this part of me that can be pathetic. And that was the bit that, you know, allowed myself to wallow when I got knocked down. And I think one of my big realizations is that, and this, this has come pretty much through Mo exclusively, maybe a little bit from other places as well, is that if you want to help yourself, best way to do that is to help others. And then it magically helps you. It helps you realize that your voice matters, particularly if your voice is telling them you can do it. When I went through my CTI supervision, sorry, my certification as a certified CTI coach, about five years after I did the original courses, one of the things you have to do in certification is have these supervision sessions. So I had three different supervisors and I had to send each of them, you know, three different recordings. And one of the guys said to me when listening to one of my recordings, I remember his name, his name is Stephen Filanti, Filianti. And he said to me, Tony, obviously, by the way, in terms of uh, confidentiality and everything, all the people I recorded the call, 
their uh, coaching sessions knew that and I gave them a deal and I said this is helping me through my certification so you get this reduced rate and they were all fine with it but he said when you're listening to people don't listen to that person with all their problems their issues their challenges their worries listen for their most magnificent self and I just went wow <laughs> so what he was saying was my job is not to actually help them to solve the problem you know, get in there with my sleeves rolled up with them. It's actually to see what this person's potential was, to see, you know, the, you know, maybe the inner child or that person when they were younger. I love one of the books I've read recently. I can't remember what it's called now, but it's about this guy who runs this company in the, in the States. And he says, each one of those employees is someone's son, has a mother and a father. He said he wants their parents to know that they are cared for in their workplace and they go back happy and fulfilled and willing to give to their family and it's it's i think that's what coaching is that's actually seeing beyond your coaches struggles and actually seeing all the positives in them seeing what they can do and actually you know asking them so you know where are you now what have you achieved so how did you do that because based on the story you've just told me that is extraordinary that you went from there and you're still you know you're still on your feet working your way through and helping people realize how fantastic they are. And yeah, that's one of the things that came across from the CTI training. Part of our role as a coach is to be a champion for somebody. It's actually to place ourselves at the hill they're trying to climb at the top with a flag saying, you can definitely do this. I'm up here. Come and join me. Well, that's beautiful, Tony. And I just, I know you don't want to talk about it, but I just want to say you've never shared that with me. And that's the first time I've ever heard. So I just want to acknowledge that deeply and profoundly. And it just, it makes me love you even more, you know, because it just makes me realize, and, and we share the bullying, uh, you know, the other experiences. I, I, I'm very fortunate that I didn't, but obviously Nadine's just recently shared out some of the things that we saw in our family. And it's, I think the shocking thing for me is that, um, is just how much of it has happened to people. And I think what's so beautiful about, you know what's happening and what's unfolding is that people are being honest about that and sharing their voice and there should be no judgment and there'll be nothing but love in mo for mm. anyone that ever finds themselves in that situation so i just wanted to say that and then i think what's really extraordinary about you is that you're one of the most positive people i've ever met as you know and also you just always see the bigger person with you know when they don't see it for themselves um you know and, and we talk about you know seeing potential and, and we see potential in people more than they can see themselves as coaches. But you do this all the time, how you give people psychological air, you know, believe in them more than they believe in themselves. And I love that metaphor of, you know, here in their hill or their mountain top, and you go and stand, you plant yourself at the top of it and go, come on, we've got this, let's do this. I just love that. I've never heard you share that as well. And it just, that metaphor, as we know, metaphors are so important, mm. just profound. It's profound that you've shared that, Tony. So I just think, I just want to acknowledge that. And, Magic does happen, as we know, in the space in between and the spaces in between, um, you know, and you role model that. And, uh, you know, as we hear and see all the time from the feedback. So um, incredible, incredible that similar, you know, similar experiences in different ways that you've transcended the, the, the you know, the people that have hurt you. And you've instead of gone to fear, you've gone to love. Like you are one of the most loving human beings I've ever met in my life. And it's just incredible. Like you just you just have, and that's what we always aspire to do in Mo, as you know, is like actually let's transcend fear and move to love. And actually let's create a loving environment and space for people where you can truly be who you are and you're an exceptional ambassador and role model of that. And you set the space as the master coach, as you know, the trainer and everything else that you do in Mo. So yeah you know amazing to hear you share that heartfelt story tony and i hope it also means for a lot of other people that they can realize that if they're hiding their voice there's a space for you to actually start to share your voice and there's a whole bunch of people and community that will listen to you and support you mm -hmm. so thank you for sharing that and you know i do see the positives in in the negative because because i think it's given me a healthy distrust of authority mm. um because it was a person in authority, you know, that I suffered from. And even the bullies, they, they had physical authority over me because I was too small. And in actual fact, that's why in a lot of ways I've struggled with some of the corporate environments because there is a lot of abuse of power. And I'm, I'm only just realizing even now that, you know, that is almost a crusade in itself as well. Rather than avoiding corporates and things like that, 
it's actually finding the you know the potential positive change makers that are in that environment and helping them to create the way it should be the way you know that every person does go home at night and their parents would be proud of the way you make them feel in your workspace yeah and, and i probably wouldn't have had that if i hadn't gone through that experience yeah no absolutely and I, just to build you know an and you know in this sense is that you and i've always talked about loving leadership you know and actually you know the fact that in so many organizations and i'm starting to see it change which is really positive is that we can't talk about love we can't talk about family and actually it that's everything you know all corporations are just a structure of people you know it's a system it is a family system whether you call it that or not and actually you can have an abusive family system or you can have a supportive loving family system and i think the really powerful thing that covid has offered is is that opportunity to start to transcend that because organizations have been forced to trust people because they work from home there's lots of other learning we don't need to get into that but i think just to build you know with you on that and and reinforce with things that we talk about off mic you know is loving leadership and actually we need more leaders that transcend that and bring love uh, both you know male and female feminine and masculine and i think we're starting to see that um you know and, and i think you're absolutely right i've always i've always enjoyed the corporate game i've always enjoyed i see it as a game um, and I've been very fortunate to get into senior roles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think as when you're in those leadership roles, you've got a massive responsibility to create the right culture. You know, and, and if you create the right culture, the right climate, the right environment, it, it can do wonders. So I'm, uh, you know, completely in agreement with you and look forward to seeing you getting into more of those organizations. Mm. We've only got a few more minutes, so I'm going to start to sort of bring this one to a close and we'll do another one. There's no doubt because there's so many sort of areas that we've not covered. And I know that, but we wanted to keep this one sort of relatively punchy because you and I could talk for probably 12 hours on one of these without <laughs> without breathing. Um, so when you think about where we are right now, and this will, this will kind of then bridge us into the next one that we do, you know, with where Mo is right now and the role that you, the absolute instrumental role as a leader of Mo and as a co-pilot in Mo and the co-contributor, what are the things that you're most proud of and what are the kind of core messages you'd like to leave anyone that's sort of interested in the coaching course or any of the courses? But the coaching is, it's your baby. It's one of your babies. It's something you're so proud of and you help create. So is there any messages you want to leave to people that are contemplating the power of coaching? I guess one of the things I'm most proud of is probably the most common feedback I get from people at the end of a course. It's fairly normal for at least one person on the course, possibly more than that, to say, this course is life changing. This course has changed my life. And, you know, one of the things I say is that my, you know, my niche is positive change makers. But a lot of those positive change makers don't actually know they're positive change makers. You know, a lot of people come on the course to learn things it's the whole me others everyone thing they learn to learn things for themselves to get to become a coach to get a qualification to communicate better with their families or their work colleagues and they actually you can see it happen over the course of a course you see a realization you've got all the people on zoom and one by one you're seeing light bulbs beginning to light up of them realizing this is much more powerful than i ever understood and I know more about myself because I never expected to get the coaching that I'm getting. I thought I was going to be learning how to coach. I didn't realize that I was going to be getting coached all the time as well. And the fact that I've quite often said it at the beginning of a course, at the end of this course, you will get amazing quality coaching from one of the people who's sitting in with you now, even though you've never done coaching before. And I remember saying that in a course in Guernsey. And the head of Guernsey Water was on the course. And at the end, right at the end of the course, he said, I remember Tony saying that. And he said, and he's absolutely right. I've had amazing coaching from all you, my colleagues, who've been on this together. So it creates human connection, which is one of my top values. Connecting at not just, you know, level of, uh, are you going to watch the game tonight? You know, that type of thing. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's quite topical. <laughs> um, but you know, what are you really about? Mm. Who are you when you are at your best, when you're most alive? And helping people learn to understand that. And it gives people so much. Tools for other people, tools for themselves, and a better understanding of, of perspective of their life. Mm. 
I can't remember what your question was. I'm not sure if I've answered it or not. <laughs> You've answered it beautifully. And it's uh, say, so, yeah, I think for me, this is a, a moment of pause for us. And then we'll go to stage two because, you know, there's more about your coaching journey and, and philosophy that I'd like to kind of bring out and then your principles and values that you've shared some today and then and then just the deeper stories because like you I share a ridiculous thirst for knowledge and learning um, and you're always sending me pictures from books of stuff that you're quoting and I, and I think that's really important for us to capture for people as well because we really do believe in the genius of everyone and everyone could be a multi-potentialite and actually if you love learning you know the 50 pound note that's up there that mum gave me a year and one month so 13 months before she passed away was my investment in you and and I think that that's what we're trying to say is like the biggest investment you can make in life is in yourself and in your learning and in your self-confidence know thyself love thyself heal thyself then you can start serving and supporting others which is where you know we're very fortunate to be is that we get to contribute to people's lives every day of our lives and you know, you're an absolute ambassador and role model for me, Tony, on that. So thank you. And, and if we could create a world where everybody was their most magnificent self, we wouldn't have climate problems. We wouldn't have any problems. Yeah. And I think that's a I think that is a the next part of the subject, because I really want to get into that bigger, more expansive space with you. You know, as, as we know, um, fear creates more fear. Love creates more love. And that's what we're all about. So thank you, TP, for part one. And I look forward to getting part two booked in. And then uh, and, and the football quote was because it's the semi-final, just so you know. So I'm hoping, come on, England! <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. No, anyway. And, and hopefully hopefully, the quality of this call is such that you can use it this time. <laughs> yeah, we don't mention that, TP. Don't, don't destroy the myth. So, yes, hopefully the quality, it sounds perfect to me and, and uh, you know, beautifully and eloquently shared by, uh, by you as always. So thank you very much, TP. Thanks, D. Now, this is a message for anybody who thinks that life coaching might be the right calling for you, but you're not sure how to attract new clients. So on the 17th of April, we will be having our next Mo Digital Academy. Keely Vuong White, the founder of Kia Ora Coaching, is going to be talking to us about how to attract clients as a new life coach, a 90 minute long introduction to marketing. Now, she's had a fantastic life and has spent 15 years in international corporate marketing and has also learned a thing or two about setting up a business and she's also done her coaching with the Mo Foundation. So she's going to be running a fantastic workshop. We hope to see you there. If you're interested and you'd like to register then please find more information on our website that's mofoundation.com forward slash calendar. Thanks so much and we will see you there.